If you want to land a job as a JavaScript developer, you not only need to understand what closures are, but you need to have a mastery over how they work, and that's because nearly any JavaScript job out there is going to ask you interview questions about closures, and they're going to be rather tricky. So in this video, to get you prepared for that interview, I'm not only going to explain what closures are, how they work, and why they're important, but I'm also going to go over some common interview questions you're going to get asked related to closures, that way you're prepared for anything they can throw at you. And if you like this video, you're definitely going to love my JavaScript simplified course. I'll link it in the description for you. It's just like this where I cover really complicated topics in great detail and simplify them for you. So if you're interested, that's going to be linked down in the description for you. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream projects sooner. And when a lot of people think of closures, they actually get confused with scoping in JavaScript. And that's because closures and scoping have a lot of overlap between the two. For example, this code on the left hand side of my screen doesn't use closures at all. It's just using the way JavaScript handles scoping. So if you don't already have a good grasp of how scoping works in JavaScript, I highly recommend checking out my complete crash course video on scoping. I'll link it in the cards and description for you before you start with this video, because closures is just a special version of scoping. And the entire idea behind closures is essentially when you have one function that executes some code, and then there's a separate function inside of that function that uses the code inside of the first function. That's the way a closure works. So let me show you a quick example of what that would look like. We're just going to simplify this code. We're going to have this function. We're just going to call it func1. It doesn't really matter what it does. And inside of here, we're just going to create a variable such as age. And then down here, we're going to have a function. We're going to call this func2 just like this. And inside of here, we're just going to console.log out age. There we go. Pretty straightforward. And then down here, we're going to return func2 from func1. And then down here, I can get essentially whatever the reference to my function is by calling func1. What that's going to do is it's going to call this function and it's going to return to me a brand new function that right here console logs my age. So I can call that down here. Now, if I actually run my code, you can see it prints out 29 just like before. And the thing that is printing that out is this func call down here. You can see if I remove that, there's nothing actually happening. So if I bring that back, you can see 29 gets printed out. This is essentially the setup for a closure. So a lot of times if you see a function with another function defined inside of it and that function is being returned, you're almost always dealing with some type of closure inside of JavaScript. Now, I know if you're just getting started with JavaScript, especially this code might be complicated to understand. So before we start diving into the nitty gritty of closures, I first want to make sure we understand what's going on here. So essentially, let's forget about this entire section with func2 right here. All this code func1 is doing is creating a variable that has a value of 29. That's literally all that this is doing. And then we're creating a brand new function that's using that variable and all it does is log it out and we're returning that function. So essentially func1, all it's doing is creating a variable for us and returning us a function that we can call that uses that variable. That's all that's happening. So when we call func1, it returns to us a value. We'll just call this result. So it's maybe a little bit easier to see what's going on. It returns to us some result. And this result is just this function right here. And it calls this function whenever we call result. And you can see it's console log in that age of 29. And that's exactly how this code is working. So the idea behind a closure is if you have a function that defines some type of values, whether you're defining a variable here, or maybe it takes in a parameter, both cases is going to work just fine. Essentially, anytime you have a function with some scope inside of it, some variables inside of it that are used inside of another function, that's going to be a closure. And the reason this is called a closure is because normally when you execute a function, all the things in that function no longer exist anymore. They go through a process called garbage collection, which if you're not familiar with, I'll link again a video in the cards and description that goes in depth into it. But essentially JavaScript just deletes those variables completely from memory and pretends they never exist. But a closure is a little bit different because this func2 that we have here depends on the value of our age variable. So instead of getting rid of that age variable like would normally happen when a function is finished executing, instead JavaScript says, you know what, this age variable is important for this other function, so I'm going to keep it in memory. Technically, it stores this in the heap based memory, but that's not really important to understand. It just says, you know what, I'm going to keep this in memory for long term until I no longer need it when this function is no longer accessible. So I know closures sound really complicated and it's really confusing what they look like, but really all a closure is is just following normal scoping rules in JavaScript. But when you have a function that returns another function or has a function inside of it that's used in other places, it's essentially saying keep the scope of whatever this function is even after the function finishes. That's all a closure is. And anytime you see this type of format where you have a function inside of another function, you're dealing with a closure. Another important thing to understand about how these closures work is they actually always are going to be using the most up to date value for that variable. For example, let's say that we change this to an age variable that we can change. And then down here we say age is equal to 30. 
you may think that this is going to print out 29 because that's what the age variable is declared as before we call our function, but actually you'll see it prints out 30 and that's because it's always going to use the most up-to-date value of whatever this variable is whenever I call this function. So the fact that age is 30 here means that it's going to print out 30 inside of this function right here. And I can even modify the age variable inside of here. For example, every time I call func2, I can add one to my age. So if I call this function a couple times, you can see every time it's adding one to the previous times call from before. So it's keeping this state entirely up to date and constantly keeping this variable in memory until it's no longer needed. And that's the whole idea of this closure is it's keeping this around longer than it normally would because this other function needs this variable in order to function. Now in an interview, you may be asked why closures are important or what you can do with closures. And to be honest, a lot of the things that were really important for closures are no longer nearly as important as they used to be because of newer features in JavaScript. For example, one of the many benefits to closures is that it gave you a really easy way to create a private variable that couldn't be accessed anywhere. And that's because in this code, this age variable is not accessible anywhere outside of func1. You can see I can't access it anywhere outside of here, which means I can't manually change this age variable. I can't say, you know, age is equal to 25. That's just going to throw me an error because this age variable is not accessible inside of here. And you can see it makes no changes to my actual code. And technically, if I was in strict mode inside of JavaScript, you'll see that this will actually throw me an error instead. But that's another video topic that I'm not going to cover here. If I do have a video on it, I'll link it in the cards and description for you. But it used to be a way for creating private variables. This is no longer nearly as important though, because with module based JavaScript, where you have module files you can import, you can really easily create variables that you don't export from the module, which in essence creates essentially a private variable. And if you want to learn more about module based JavaScript, I have a video, I'll link that in the cards and description. It's really important to understand because it's how most modern JavaScript is written. Now, another use case for closures, that's something that is actually still useful, even though you may not see it that often is it allows you to create functions that essentially can use parameters to do other things. So let's say that I can create a function right here. That's called like create element, element creator something like that. And this is going to take in some type of value, maybe the element that I want to create. And by default, let's just say it's going to be a div element, but it doesn't really matter. We'll just say it's going to take in an element. And then what this is going to do is it's going to return to us a function. And we can just do this in line as an arrow function. If you don't know what arrow functions are, again, I'll link a video in the cards and description for you. But this function right here is just going to return document.createElement. And it's going to take in whatever that element type is that we want to create. So now I can say element creator. And this is going to be for creating any div element. So now I have a function, which is going to be called div creator, or maybe we'll just call it create div. There we go. So now anytime I call create div, this is going to return to me essentially a brand new div based element. So I can call create div and I can do the same thing for a span creator. So this one's going to be for creating span elements. And now I can come in here and say that I'm going to have a span creator. And if I call that function, now essentially I'm creating three divs and I'm creating one span that I can use however I want inside of my code. So it's a really great technique to be able to say, okay, you know what? I want to be able to create elements really easily and I can just pass in what the type of element is and it gives me a brand new function that allows me to create them. Obviously, this is a very simple example, but you can imagine your code is much more complex for what's going on in this function and it allows you to do a really easy way to create essentially helper functions that have certain parameters already predefined inside of them. This is a use case that you will see inside of code and is still useful because it's pretty much the best way to do this type of thing. So we've talked about what closures are and we just finished talking about some of the use cases that closures have inside of JavaScript. So now I want to talk about some of the trickier interview questions that you're going to get asked related to closures that's going to really help you impress the people that are interviewing you. And one of the most common, if not the most common closure based question you're going to get is going to look something like this. We're going to have a for loop. We're going to say let i equal to zero. I is less than three. I plus plus a very simple for loop that just executes three separate times. And inside of here, we're going to run a set timeout or whatever it is. It doesn't really matter, but it's going to be some type of asynchronous function like this. That's going to console.log i. And then we're going to come in here and we're going to say that it's going to have a hundred millisecond delay. So the question essentially asks, what do you think that this code is going to be printing out? And if you may think the code is going to print out zero, one, two, and we save, and you'll notice that is exactly what the code prints out. But a lot of times when they ask you these particular questions, instead of using let here, they're going to be using var. And now you're going to notice that it's going to give us completely different results when it prints out. Instead of 0, 1, 2, it's going to give us the result 3, 3, 3. If I give this a save, you can see once that finished executing, it printed out 3, 3 separate times. So instead of printing out 0, 1, 2, it printed out 3, 3, 3. 
Now, this is probably really confusing to you and it's confusing to most people, honestly, but I'm gonna explain exactly why this is. That way, if you get asked an interview question like this, you can understand exactly what's going on and it's all related to how scoping and closures work together. So when you're using a var based variable, var is different than let and const because instead of being block scoped, var is essentially scoped a little bit more globally. It's more function based scoped. So here what's happening is it's taking this var i equals zero and essentially it's saying, you know what, we actually have a variable declared up here called i and by default it's gonna be equal to undefined. And all we're doing down here is setting i equal to zero and each time we run this code, we're just adding one to i every single time. So we have one singular i variable declared at the very top of our function here, or top of our file, and we're just updating that variable in our for loop. That's how the var variable works. And if I actually change this to let, you'll notice we still get the exact same thing where three gets printed out three separate times. That's just because if you define the variable up here, you have one single instance of that variable. And when we talked about closures, we said the closure is always going to use the most up-to-date version of that variable. So when we run this for loop, it starts out at zero, it adds one to one, adds one again to two, and it adds one again to three, and at this point, three is obviously not less than three, so the for loop finishes. Then, 100 milliseconds later, our set timeout runs, and it prints out three, three separate times, because we have one global i variable, which is always using the most up-to-date value for. Now, the difference is, if we use let here, instead of having this variable be globally defined up here, like this, instead what's happening is we have three separate i variables being created, one for each iteration of our for loop. And that's because let and const as well are both block scoped, which means anytime you have curly braces like this, it essentially is using a brand new variable every single time. So the first time we run this, i is equal to zero. And then the second time we run this, we have a brand new i variable, which is going to be equal to one. And then we have a brand new i variable, which is equal to two. That is why when we actually save and run this code, we get zero, one, two, if we're using let here, while if we use var, we instead get three, three, three being printed out because of how those different variables work inside of scoping. Now, if this talk of let versus var and other things is confusing for you, I have a full video covering the differences between let, var, and const. I'll link in the cards and description for you. And if you reference that video along with my scoping based video, this should hopefully all kind of come together into one cohesive thought that really starts to make a lot of sense. But this right here is the most common interview question you're going to get asked. And the thing you want to look for is whether or not they're using var or let. If they're using let, it'll work just like you normally expect it to, while var is kind of interesting because of the way that it works with hoisting. Now, I know this is all really confusing, but honestly, the most important thing to understand about closures is that they work just like normal scoping, but it's kind of a special case for when you have functions inside of other functions. That's really all you need to understand about closures in order to be a master of them. Now, if you enjoyed this video and you really liked this deep dive approach, you're going to love my JavaScript simplified course. I'll link it in the description for you. It's a full complete course that covers literally everything you ever need to know about JavaScript, not only to be a junior developer, but to even take your skills to a more intermediate and mid-level developer. It truly covers everything that you need to know and is absolutely massive. I'll link that down in the description for you. Also, if you want something free, you can check out, I have multiple free PDF cheat sheets for different JavaScript concepts, such as the different DOM traversal methods, or maybe even different array methods that you may want to know as a JavaScript developer. I'll link those in the description below for you too. They're completely free for you to download. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.